Delighted to be here. Um, it's a great morning uh, for the Music and Therapy Trust, and we're delighted for the invitation to be here today. I agree with Dr. Gibson. I like that uh, analogy of an onion. Uh, I can remember back in 1988 doing some research at Queen's. Uh, and I, when I started to get into the paired and unpaired t tests in psychology, I also felt like crying. <laughs> but look, you know, Mr. Wells, the late great violinist, Yehud Menuhin, I probably pronounced that wrongly. Yehudi. 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 <laughs> Just checking everybody who's listening. <laughs> Said music is a therapy. It is a communication far more powerful than words. It's far more immediate and far more efficient. And I think, Professor Brown, that scientific research now bears that out. And I know that's a sentiment that is shared by many of us here today. I enjoyed talking with Dr. Rogan. I'd worked many years in the past with her and many others of you here today in the CAM service. Can I just say thank you for the work that you do? I've seen it firsthand, the waterfall that you stand under every day. But we're all surrounded, aren't we, by music in our daily lives. Many of us use it every day. We use it often without thinking. We use it to express ourselves and also to give meaning to our thoughts. And I've found music therapy very effective. Most lately, if you go on the BBC iPlayer, you can see the view and you will see the health minister in full flow at the Northern Ireland versus the Faroes football match, in full flow, personally experiencing the benefits of music therapy to the tune of Neil Diamond's Sweet Caroline. <laughs> it was therapeutic for me. I learned a lot from it. I learned that we in the DUP were allowed to dance. I also never laughed as hard. <laughs> but a warning that music therapy, if you watch it, can actually potentially do you some harm as well. But no, uh, all joking aside, I'm delighted the Minister has taken time out of what I know is probably one of the most hardest in terms of work. I remember when I was in the health service, um, the parliamentary ombudsman, Tom Frawley, went on, was then the chief executive of the Western Health Board, and he took us away on a course where we had to build bridges down in Runkery and do all sorts of team building uh, to experience management in the health service. And he concluded with the words that well, I now send you out as young managers into the health service, where the key is to manage infinite demand with finite resource. And I know that's shared here today, and it's also shared with the health minister. And I know the pressures that are there, but it also shows the importance uh, here today that that's there. But from back to the Beatles, from Tchaikovsky to Taylor Swift, there's a full range of emotions that become unleashed and found within us. It can calm us, it can relax us, but it also can motivate us and it can excite us. Because music has universal appeal, it can be enjoyed by almost everybody, regardless of age or ability. Recently opened the 6th World Congress on Mental Health and Deafness here in Belfast. It was treated a wonderful performance by the choir of the Jordanstown School for Children who are deaf or visually impaired. Now, having seen how much those young people enjoyed their performance, I think we believe that music therapy has the potential to help people of all ages with a wide range of disabilities and conditions. Because music therapy can help to develop communication, it can help to develop emotions, physical, sensory, social, and cognitive skills. These skills are hugely important. They allow people to fulfill their potential, and they can help them to access new opportunities. Raising those skills can improve the effectiveness of other types of therapeutic interventions. The unique properties of music therapy mean it has the potential to play a vital role in sustaining the health and well-being of our society into the future. It is well known that Northern Ireland experiences higher levels of mental health problems than other parts of the United Kingdom. 
It has been estimated that mental health issues cost Northern Ireland £4 billion pounds every year through health and social care costs, loss of output and, of course, the human cost. We should not underestimate the importance of early and cost-effective interventions to ensure that people of all ages with mental health problems are able to access the services they need and to access the services they need when they need them. We recognise the importance of the research undertaken by the Northern Ireland Music Therapy Trust and by Queen's University on the use of music therapy interventions for children and young people with behavioural, emotional and mental health issues. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence about the benefits of music therapy, but this study, I believe, is the largest trial to date into the effectiveness of this type of intervention. We welcome the findings that uh, have been outlined here this morning. You'll learn more about the application of music therapy in just a few moments. I know that further follow-up of the participants is due to continue, and I look forward to the forthcoming analysis of the longer-term benefits and the cost-effectiveness of music therapy as an intervention that's going to follow in due course. Because the findings of this research will contribute significantly to discussions on policy and service development for people with disabilities and mental health problems across Northern Ireland. It's very exciting that a research project carried out here is likely to deliver so much wider benefit right across uh, well, right across the world. So finally, can I pay tribute to the hard work, the commitment of the research team, to thank the children and the young people who took part in the study, because the ability to communicate is something that most of us just take for granted. It's critical that the voices of those who are the most vulnerable are heard, not just in their own immediate circle, but also in government. And as I hand over to Jennifer here, let me assure you that you can rest assured that the executive will continue to listen to those voices. Um, can I first of all just thank Kira and Sam for inviting me here to, to uh, say a few words at your conference. Um, unfortunately, because uh, we're in a joint office, you get two of us, so I try and be as brief as possible. Um, I first heard of music therapy, um, I didn't know what it was until I visited Parkview Special Needs School. And one day when I was at the school, um, one, there was a, a child there who um, was at the far end of the autism spectrum and is, he had very little communication skill or communication um, uh, capabilities in that. And one of the, the teachers at the school was actually um, was using music therapy to help him communicate and help him, you know, um, you know, uh, sort of, you know, just just sort of help him to communicate with her, but also help him to communicate with the rest of the pupils and that in the school. And that was my first introduction to uh, music therapy at that time. Um, and then uh, about several weeks later, I was actually going around uh, doing a number of house visits in my local constituency. And a girl who was, I knocked the door on, you know, invited me in um, to, to speak to her. And it was at the time the, the, the funding had run out of, or, uh, during the, the period for people who had been trained in music therapy and the teachers. And, you know, she brought me in and she was talking to me about it and that. And, you know, I had that conversation with her and uh, I later on met her again up at Stormont when she had come up to lobby MLAs and that. But I have to say, you know, just watching that child, um, and as I say, the child w w was at the far end of the, the autism spectrum, um, to, to actually watch the, the, what that child got out of that, if you like, was very, very uh, meaningful in, in, my, in my view. And I actually expressed that view to, to the, the Minister for Health at that time. So, I mean, I, I, I want to just start off by saying, you know, I really uh, support what you're doing. Um, I hope that this research in particular that Sam outlined earlier will actually influence the decision makers 
and hopefully the health minister, I, I don't want to put him on the spot, but you know that these type of therapies do actually work, these new creative therapies, you know, and not, in, in, uh, uh, not just in terms of music therapy, but I know some of other therapies that are more creative, more innovative, you know, that the GPs are now recognising their worth um, to treat people and to help people in a holistic way. So I, I wish you all the best for it in, in the future anyway. And people do face significant challenges in their daily lives and vulnerable people, particularly in our society, can experience poor health and well-being. And I know Sam mentioned earlier about deprivation and areas of disadvantage and people who come from maybe families or communities that, that are um, you know, high deprivation and disadvantage. And I know that, that their health needs um, are very much to the fore also when, when we're, we're looking at policy. Um, and communication difficulties and isolation difficulties in expressing their thoughts and feelings are very real, very, very real for those people, those young people, but particularly for their families also. And we at the Executive are acutely aware that in our role as decision makers, we need to ensure that we put those who need help at the heart of any of the policies that we make. We will promote and protect their rights and ensure that they have appropriate support to access the same opportunities as everyone else. We welcome the work of projects such as Music in Mind, which shows some of the ways we can provide support to those who need it most. And it is very clear from what we've already heard today that music therapy has the potential to have a positive impact on lives. And as Marion says during her introduction, Jonathan and myself uh, in the Office of the First and Deputy First Minister also have overall responsibility for coordinating policy on children and young people right across the executive. And it is alarming that 20% of our young people experience significant mental health problems even before they turn 18. So we have a particular interest in the Music in Mind project which focuses on children and young people and can help in this area. And this project, taken forward jointly by the Music Therapy Trust and Queen's University, also highlights the value of working across a number of organisations and sectors to deliver outcomes for the people who need them. And we ourselves are trying to do that up in the Executive and the Assembly at the moment. There's a policy, that, a framework that we're working under called Delivering Social Change, and particularly in terms of looking at any policy around children and young people. We're trying to ensure that all departments you know, are, are working in a joint up way and delivering the best services that we can and delivering the best policy that we can because people working in silos in different departments, it just doesn't work anymore. It's proven that it doesn't work and we need to have that more collaborative um, view of when we're, de we're, we're, we're dealing with policy or we're dealing with services. So our delivering social change framework includes the executive's disability strategy which covers all ages and all types of disability including mental health and we hope to publish the first annual report on the strategy before this Christmas. It will provide an update on the actions that all departments have taken to improve the lives of people with disabilities and to ensure the implementation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. As an executive, we will continue to do all that we can to help everyone to participate meaningfully in society and to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to achieve their potential. And that's no more, more real where children are concerned, because all, ch all children have the right, you know, all children have the right to realise their potential. I have three children, my children are all teenagers, and I see... There, even in them, I see individual skills and that they have and individual talents that they have. And I think that, that it's important that we encourage them to, to go forward in life and go forward to, to whatever, the, whatever life paths they take, um, but to ensure that we, at a, a government level and anybody in a decision-making um, role, do make those decisions that enable all children no matter what disability a child would have, no matter what uh, levels of deprivation or what family circumstances they have or what social circumstances or indeed economic circumstances the families have, we need to ensure that all children, because they do have that right. So I just want to finish off again by thanking Kira and Sam for inviting me here. I'm sorry I can't stay for the rest of the conference, but certainly I know some of our officials will hopefully um, take back any um, sort of... Uh, 
any comments or anything that you want to, to talk to me and Jonathan about, our doors are always open and hopefully um, we'll see some of you in the near future. Thank you.